All right, so this is the Twisted History podcast. It's the Twisted History of Medal of Honor. Of the Medal of Honor. That's what we'll call it. Of the Congressional Medal of Honor. Listen, it's it has nothing to do with Congress. Nobody from Congress gets it. It's issued by Congress or given out by Congress, but it's a military medal, right? So I'm just going to call it the Medal of Honor. Twisted History of the Medal of Honor or Medal of Honor recipients. We're going to work this out at some point. I think this is one of the ones that we're going to try to keep above board. A lot of times I have history teachers and people who want their kids to learn about certain aspects of history, particularly stuff that we cover here, but they can't because I drop a lot of C words and F words and, and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to try to refrain from that after I get done with a couple of DMs. And then I'm going to introduce everybody who's on the dais today. Got two DMs, one from... A lady, I think she hit Annie, saying that she thinks the recurring uh, sloppy tits joke is getting a little bit tired. I 100% disagree. I do. I 100% disagree. There's no way I'm ever stopping it. I might stop it for this one, but there's no way that thing ever stops. I apologize. Uh, you'll have to go elsewhere. And then the second was a young lady just started listening to Twisted History. She's listening to us on four times speed. Do you guys Whoa. listen to podcasts? <laughs> I listen on two time. I listen on one and a half. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and... And then when you go back to from two times or one and a half, when you go back to regular. Oh, it sounds like people are just walking through laboring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a one and a half guy, two time guys. I try to be sometimes. She listens to us on four. That's got to sound like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yeah. yeah. Four times speed. And she's like, I don't know what block she's up to because now we're almost 200 episodes deep. So if you're going to, by the way, a lot of people have hit me saying they've been listening to the whole catalog. God bless you. Uh, tell Erica. Um, but the thing is, she's like listening to you on four times speed. All you do is talk about Joe DiMaggio's dick. I don't believe that's true. I mean, Joe DiMaggio has a wrench. <laughs> I and think I've I spoke... would know that. We definitely do not. But I think maybe, like, I speak about Liam Neeson's dick much more than Joe DiMaggio's dick. Liam Neeson dick. gets, yeah, definitely. Uncle, or Mer- who's Milton Burl. Uncle Birdie. Milton Burl. Milton Burl. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> Milton Burl. So, uh, but I, I told the story that she probably hates where Pete Rose had to take a shower with him, and he's like, I turned around, and I saw, you know, this giant dick with Joe DiMaggio hanging off the end of it. Like, I like that story. (laughs) So perhaps she's just in a rut where I've told it three or four times. So again, along with the sloppy tits thing, there is no (laughs) moratorium with Joe (laughs) DiMaggio's dick, right? He was a great American, a great baseball player, took care of Marilyn towards the end, even though she was a little bit of a hua. Even after. Yeah, so I... um, I'm a big fan of Joe DiMaggio and his dick. All right, so that's it. We're going to try to keep it above board from now on. Okay, we're into it. Twisted history of Medal of Honor recipients. And this episode, we're glad to have, for the first time, <laughs> in the seat. Go ahead. No, we're not going to talk about massive dicks. We're going to talk about massive balls. Medal yeah, yeah, of Honor big, recipients. big balls, guys. <laughs> um, so, uh, first time on. Is, uh, is Captain Cons. Captain Cons is a very close friend of mine, a very close friend of Annie's, a close friend of everybody in this room. Um, his wife, Alex, is, is basically uh, crowning right now. She's about to have a kid any second. <laughs> <laughs> He's celebrating his uh, year anniversary just this weekend. Annie and I were down at his wedding in Naples and just an all-around good guy. I'm going to ask for the intro and what he did and all that stuff in a sec, but I also want to mention that Vibs is here. We often talk like when we have a... Um, a guest, whether it makes more sense to be two or three deep. But I think this will be a little bit more conversational. And obviously, I always love to have Vibs here for everything. Um, By the way, you just set yourself up for such a big Joe DiMaggio joke right there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, (laughs) No, no, for the kids. This one's for the kids. I know, that's why I didn't say Uh, it. St. Anne already uh, busted in on the mic because she can't help herself. So St. Anne is here, in case you guys didn't know. (laughs) Almost 15 seconds without me saying it. And then JC is on the ones and twos. Jack Coleman is here. Um, Con, so we're going to talk about Medal Mm. of Honor recipients. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell people what you did uh, for our country. As some may know and some may not, just like you like to remind people that you went to Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. I think it's uh, important <laughs> that I remind folks that I started my military career at West Point. I graduated from West Point, commissioned into the Army as a <clears throat> second lieutenant, as an artillery officer. I went to Fort Sill, Oklahoma to learn all about the artillery and how to fire cannons from very, very far away. So you could actually say, because there is a science to firing the rockets, ipso facto, I'm a rocket scientist. Ah. I wouldn't say that. Some might. Right. We'll go with it. From there, I uh, was stationed at Fort Hood, Texas, and in June of 2008, I deployed to Iraq from Fort Hood, Texas. And actually, if you're listening to this, we discussed on Zero Blog 30, the podcast I do with Chaps and Kate, our reflections, because this 
week was the 20th anniversary of the invasion of Iraq and the start of the conflict there. So we had some interesting reflections on that. Got a little emotional, I will admit. Uh, but yeah, no, I served in Iraq for a year, came home, served out my time on active duty, and then I moved back home to New Jersey, where I am from, and fast forward, and here I am today. Zero Blog 30 is the podcast. It's the most noble thing that we do here at Barstool. I just did a finance podcast, um, uh, family office, with Tyler Morin and Kenny Polcari, Yeah, who's one of my old friends. Love and Kenny. Kenny is, uh, he's a big proponent of the... Give me the charity. Uh, Headstrong. Headstrong. So yes, the Headstrong, the Headstrong Project, Project yeah. which Headstrong we've, Project. we have been very big proponents of, and they offer free mental health care to post 9-11 veterans. Right. Uh, I apologize for forgetting the name. I do remember when we first got here, I think it was uh, Kate who was being honored at one of their things, one of their uh, evenings. So we had gone. We all got uh, pretty dressed up. I had great shoes on. Kate had spoke at it. And every time oh, I... Oh, so that was actually uh, the organization that I am on the board of directors for. Okay. Operation Heal Our Heroes. Okay. So many guys. And yeah. I'll tell you, the thing We're is involved. around... The thing about this is that when you go to any of these, Headstrong, Heal Our Heroes, any one of these uh, veteran organization functions, it's staggering how many vets kill themselves. Flat out. It's just absolutely fucking staggering. So there are so many things that can't be treated with a prosthetic and places... Uh, like Heal Our Heroes and the Headstrong Project do a great job with it. Ipso facto, uh, uh, Zero Block Dirty does a great job of bringing awareness uh, from the veteran community's perspective. So if you feel like listening to that, it's Uncle Chaps, it's Kate, and it's Cons every week, Zero Block Dirty. Uh, Vibs, have you ever served our country? Uh, now, service, that's something service you don't, comes in you a lot of forms. Think about. <laughs> yeah, no, I was trying to think of a service that I've done, and I, I, I can't even bullshit an answer. No. no right. <laughs> Not even like a community service. Uh, Jack, yeah. anything? I mean, I worked in Manasquan Beach technically for the town, so... right. You but know, not even like a ROTC or anything like that? I lived with ROTC kids. Okay. So they're go. mostly Navy, though. So, That's all right. Yeah. You all still right. supported them. Oh, of course. Yeah. Exactly. Annie? I have never served anything no. like that. I mean, I, I definitely support them. We do charity. We do volunteer work. Right. But nothing compares to what you Were you ever exactly promiscuous at Fleet service, Week? <laughs> <laughs> like when the boys came I to the town? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, that's why we Annie, brought... Annie, does a uniform do anything for you? Who doesn't a uniform do something? Just about like any that? uniform. Sometimes yeah. it puts me in a Popeye's uniform. Yeah. She's like, where's my chicken sandwich? I don't know. She's like, I don't have any money to pay for it. What can we do? I'm like, oh, let's work something out. So, Girls yeah. on the floor would go wild uh, for Fleet Week. Oh, I'm I missed not, out on that. Every oh, time man. somebody in a uniform would come and ring the bell, forget mm -hmm. it. I mean, they had options. Yeah. No. Yeah. Put it that way. I had one me, girl in particular. For a century. She look, one girl in particular we work with, she looked like she just got off a horse. When fucking Fleet Week was around? <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there were a kids. lot of them. <laughs> yeah. and there were not a lot of girls on the floor. <laughs> but So that's why we have cons in here, for uh, some perspective. Uh, did you win any medals? Is that a, that's not a rude thing to say, right? Um, you know what? Some people might get all twisted in their shorts about winning because you don't win anything. I'm going to get into that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But do you have any medals? Yeah. Okay. If, uh, if you had to guess which branch of the military has the most, Navy, right? No, probably not. Just because the army's Navy. been around, we, we can all agree the navy probably. No, no, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. they're the God's most brave. Very, he's very pro. Uh, <laughs> no, I, pro I, I I googled the fact. It is the army. They're, they've go. been around the longest. Who has more it is titles though? Two thousand four hundred and fifty-one. No more national football. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. army. Who, who has army more national championships and more Heisman Trophy winners? Yeah. Well, I, I'm not sure, but half of those were awarded during the Civil War. Yeah. Wow. wow. But, and I'm, I'm going to get into all that shit. Chaps is a Purple Heart winner. Purple Heart recipient. Purple Heart recipient, excuse me. I have a Bronze Star. A Bronze Star. That's bronze Star recipient. Award. Yeah. Okay. I, I try to pay attention to um, I try to pay attention to pronouns and all that shit that seems important to people nowadays, and I try to do it. So if I keep saying winner, then I'm not doing anybody <laughs> any kind of... Uh, any kind of service here. I think people, by and large, know what you're getting at and, and don't really get upset about that. It's just the real hardos who will get you for it. Like, Ugh, you don't actually yeah. win anything. Yeah. So, don't worry about it. The living recipients <laughs> do not view the Medal of Honor as something that was won. Like, I won the National Buffalo Wing Eating Contest in Buffalo five years ago. Amateur division. Oh, that's that's okay. something that they don't. They view the medal as something that was bestowed upon them to carry as a symbol of the sacrifices of all those who served. In the past, winner was used a great deal, right? But out of respect for those who currently wear the medal, 
the CMOHS committee S is please use the term recipient. So I'm going to be aware of that for the rest of this podcast. I'm glad that I screwed up a little bit before that. Um, Got it out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, National Medal Medal of Honor Day is March 25th. We're amazingly oh. ahead oh, yeah. of the uh, game. So we're we're taping this on March 21st, and it won't be out for a week from Wednesday, a week from Thursday. So we're ahead of the game. But know that in and around National Medal of Honor Day is when we're um, taping this. There's nothing particularly twisted about this episode, right? None of these guys um, – or involved in bestiality or pedophilia, as far as I knew. And yeah. If they were, I wasn't paying attention to it. This is going to be straightforward history of men and just one woman uh, who are certainly better than me and quite possibly better than everybody who's listening right now. Um, we've gone off the beaten path doing the past two uh, episodes, right? Like we had the gentleman whose father had made deep throat <laughs> last week. We got a little bit randy all over the place. <laughs> this is going to be sort of right down the middle, and I can't wait to do it. Um, I will tell you, too, one of the most difficult things for Annie and I to do when we're researching this stuff is figuring out who to talk to. I'll get into the numbers of it, but there are literally thousands of people who won this medal and uh, who received this medal. <laughs> you got to you keep there. me up That's on one. that, please. We'll, That's yeah, one. we'll keep it up. Well, I'll, I'll get there. And they them. No, I'm just kidding. And all <laughs> of these people have great stories for the most part. You know, so it's it's tough to to pick and choose. I know that in the past we've mentioned a couple of Medal of Honor recipients, and I won't go too far back with uh, naming all of them, but Roy Benavides, uh, we did the Twisted History of 1968. Remember when we carved out a couple of years that we think we were going to do? Yep. 1968 was a fascinating year. Mm -hmm. So much happened. Oh, fascinating year. And Roy Benavides was one of the more fascinating people. So go back and listen to the Twisted History of 1968. Listen to Roy Benavidez and his six hours of hell is what it's been called collo- colloquially, right? I'm going to say the skinny on this. Do you know about this story? Uh, yeah, I think everyone ahead. does. Yeah. Benavidez uh, sustained seven major gunshot wounds, had shrapnel in his head, scalp, shoulder, buttocks, feet, chest, legs, had both his arms slashed by a bayonet and had a collapsed lung. He had gone out. And so, uh, again, listen to the whole thing. Right. Because he went in to, to rescue a bunch of his comrades that were in the suck. And as he was pulling people out and getting them to the chopper, he was getting more and more hurt to the point where he finally just collapsed. They put him in a body bag and were about to zip it up. And all he could manage to do was spit at the doctor. It's the only reason they knew not to zip it up and put this guy in the fucking garbage pile. All right. Oh, excuse my language. He was originally awarded the Distinguished Service Cross because his superiors thought he would die and wanted him to be awarded something before his death. Right. But in 1981... His award was upgraded to the Medal of Honor. And believe me, if anyone deserves a Medal of Honor, it was Roy Benavides. A fascinating story. And when President Ronald Reagan awarded it to Benavides, this was 13 years later, uh, he accepted it with two pieces of shrapnel still lodged in his heart. Those are the type of stories that you get just throughout, you know, just Googling Medal of Honor winners, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's the direction that we're going to hope to take on this uh, on this episode, there are little there are literally thousands of stories like that. So if I miss your favorite, please forgive me. I'm going to start with facts, just some facts. We already alluded to some of them, and this is from the Congressional Medal of Honor Service dot org, C M O H S dot org. So you can look at that and you can get the whole skinny. The Medal of Honor is the United States' highest award for military valor in action. I'm not sure I knew that. I'm not sure there isn't something secretive no. that I didn't know about. The Medal of Honor is that's the top. The, that's the very, very top. Yeah. The standards to award the Medal of Honor have evolved over time, but the medal has always stood for actions that go above and beyond. Are we sure Are we sure there isn't like a secret list that the president has of men's names? <laughs> yes. Where he's like, yeah. uh, Johnson. Not, not yeah. to my knowledge, but I guess yeah. that's what would make it secret. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so above and beyond is something that we hear a lot when we talk about uh, Medal of Honor winners. The current criteria was established in 1963 during Vietnam, and here is the current criteria. The medal is authorized for any military service member who distinguishes himself conspicuously by gallantry and intrepidity at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty while engaged in an action against an enemy of the United States. Okay, so that's one. There are certain um, caveats to that. If it's not against an enemy of the United States, right. if they're fighting with a friend of the United States against an enemy. Of the, so there's certain caveats to that, but it's co- sort of straightforward. Can, 
All recommendations require thorough reports on the act itself for which they won and at least two sworn eyewitness statements from it. Right. So that's the thing, too. I think even once you have all of that, it still is up for review, right? So there's certain times and stories that we've heard from, we'll just take the last 20 years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and you would think like, oh, well, that's a Medal of Honor, no doubt. Mm -hmm. But there still is an extensive review process. They, that's all to say that they don't hand them out like candy. Recommendation packets must be approved all the way up the military command structure Question. and then with the commander in chief. Go ahead. It says authorized for any military service member. Mm -hmm. Has there ever been a civilian that's won the Medal of Honor? No, no. I'm, I'm going to get to her. Oh, I'm going to yeah. get to her. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And Large. I'll tell you, there were quite a few, and they were that their medals were actually rescinded. And then Ooh. only six of them were, were given back their medals posthumously. So Damn. yeah, there, there's there's a bunch of like little things on the CMOHS. I kind of listen. I love the stories, but I also love the stats. Yeah, I love when you know you hear yeah. So by federal statute, recommendations for the medal must be submitted within three years of the Valorous Act, mm -hmm. and the medal must be presented within five years. Any submissions outside of that timeline require an act of Congress to waive the time limits. Like Ray Benavides, mm -hmm. an act of Congress got him his medal 13 years later. Since its first recipient, Civil War Army Private Jacob Parrot, Parrot, like the bird, on March 25th, 1863. Since 1863, 3,535 <coughs> Medal of Honors, Medals of Honor, I think it would be, yeah, Medals of Honor, have been given to 3,516 individuals. <coughs> the dichotomy there is that there have been 19 servicemen who have received two medals of honor. And only 65 of that 3,516 are still alive. Mm -hmm. Okay? Going forward, we had said we're going to try and keep up with recipient versus winner. Please keep on me for that. Okay? Do you have to be a U I mean, Here's a frequently asked question. I tore this right from the website. Do you have to be a U.S. citizen to receive the Medal of Honor? First of all, a U.S. citizen. Mm -hmm. And the answer is no, you fucking idiot. Oh, I can't. I curse. You don't have to be a U.S. citizen, but you do have to serve in the U.S. military. There have been at least 764 foreign-born recipients, and not all of them chose to become citizens. It, Ireland and Germany are the most common non-U.S. birth locations for non-citizen Medal of Honor recipients. Ireland and Germany, two great places. Absolutely. Yeah, Germany had a little trouble for a, a little yeah. bit, but otherwise, it's not a surprising great place. that Ireland's up yeah. there. Yeah, the only time members of a foreign country's military have been awarded the medal was following World War One, when Congress passed special legislation allowing the medal to pre to be presented to the unknown soldiers of some of U.S.'s allies. So the unknown soldiers of Belgium, France, Great Britain, Italy, and Romania are all listed as recipients of the Medal of Honor. I think that's cool. Yeah. New York has the most recipients accredited to that state. New York with 676. Out of the 3,500, nearly 700 from New York. Followed by Pennsylvania with 380. Followed by Massachusetts with 264. Followed by Ohio with 253. Followed by Illinois rounding out the top five with 208. I will tell you right now, New York, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Ohio, and Illinois. What do they all have in common? They have big, big cities in them, like Chicago, New but York City, all Boston. North. Yeah, like northern is, cities. Is the South full of cowards? And the answer is sort of alluded to what Kahn's had said. Out of the 3,500, 1,500 or so was issued during the Civil War. Oh, right. They weren't allowed to issue them to the losing side. Right. So the Confederate soldiers never had received medals of honor. So that's why it's so heavily weighted to the north. We're not calling the south uh, cowards. You can. I don't care. It's Yellow okay belly cowards. <laughs> yeah. I'm okay with that. Yeah. yeah. Some Lily guy Liberty. named Dave D on Twitter. I'm not even fact checking this because I hope it's right. So please don't fact check it. Weymouth, Massachusetts. Is that how they pronounce it? Yeah, Weymouth. Mm -hmm. uh, has five Medal of Honor recipients, the most of any town. I don't know if that's true, but I'm hoping it is. And by the way, you're like so... Let's say you're born in Indiana, but you're considered a New York uh, Medal of Honor winner if where you enlisted was in New York ah. State. Makes sense. So people who enlisted in Weymouth, Mass, 
five of them is the most of any town. Mm -hmm. And most notably was a guy named Eldon Johnson. And this guy, Dave D., said, large, he was an absolute boss in World War II. I checked, and he was. He was serving as a private in the 15th Inf Infantry Regiment, 3rd Infantry Division, when his unit was ambushed, uh, ambushed near Valmontone, Italy. So the deal with this guy, Eldon Johnson, is I guess they were all bunkered in and they were just receiving all this hostile fire. So what he did is he had jumped out with his machine gun and ran towards the fire while 12 of his uh, teammates or comrades was able to escape. Like shooting from the hip with a machine gun, he killed a bunch of people, then pulled out his firearm while he took multiple things, and he was awarded the uh, uh, the medal posthumously. Wow. And that's a guy from Weymouth, Mass. So Weymouth, Mass is the capital of the world as far as I'm concerned for medals of honor. He, he was right. Fact, quick fact check. Yeah. Uh, it was Weymouth, yeah. Weymouth, cool. For all military service members of for whom history has recorded ranks, 77% of medals of honor have gone to enlisted personnel. I found that to be surprising. Only 23% went to officers. Cons, you're an officer. Yes. Um, interesting. Yeah, I think so. The yeah. Army is number one with a bullet, with the most medals, well over 2,000. Out of 3,500, Army has over 2,000. The Navy has 749. The Marine Corps has only 300. And the Air Force has 19. And the Coast Guard has only one. Mm -hmm. We told you how yeah. we were looking forward to like maybe Mick joining the Coast Guard, and Andy and I had gone down <laughs> to Camp May, and instead he's tearing it up. He's the Riz God down in Alabama. Yeah, he made a good choice for himself. I'm yeah, happy yeah. for him down there mm -hmm. at Alabama. And I think what is interesting about all those numbers, two things. Number one, you know, they're relative to the size yeah. uh, and the age of mm -hmm. each branch of the military. Certainly the Air Force, by nature, it's a little bit harder. You know, we're not engaged in a lot of air to air combat. So to receive the Medal of Honor in the Air Force, I think, is uh, exceptionally special. And that takes a lot for me to credit the Air Force for anything. Mm -hmm. um, and then also you, you're like, oh, I would think the Marines would have more. Well, the Marines as a fighting force tiny. is just tiny compared to the Army. So it's no surprise that the Army has the most. And I think <coughs> what we should also call out when just from a numbers perspective, about thirty five hundred recipients mm -hmm. in in all time that's point zero zero eight percent of all people who have ever served in the military in the united states wow. are medal of honor recipients just to give you some context of the nature of this award we did a twisted history of pilots mm -hmm. and i didn't tell the story of too many american pilots right because there's so many cool like german pilots in world war one and world war two but even the few that I mentioned, I don't even remember if they were recipients. Like it just I'm going to pay ten more attention to it now that we're doing this. But it's always been like if somebody said Medal of Honor recipient, I didn't give it that much weight. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's not true until I'd gotten to meet Kyle Carpenter. And we'll talk about him in a second. Yep. Yeah, because I had the pleasure. What were you going to say, Vibzi? I'm sorry. I was going to ask Cons. Uh, we were talking earlier about the 77 percent of medals go to enlisted personnel versus the 20 percent with officers. Mm -hmm. Why do you think? That is, personally, if you had to guess, an educated guess. Um, I, again, I, not that, you know. And there's just more of them? Yes. Yeah. I, I mean, so to give you context, like when I went to Iraq, I mm -hmm. was a platoon leader. There mm -hmm. was one of me and 33 of soldiers in my platoon. So I think it's really just, just a, a numbers thing. A numbers game, yeah, yeah. for sure. So it's not a cowardice thing. Yeah. No. Yeah, no, yeah, no. sure? No. <laughs> well, All right, well so I will it. say this, too. I will say this, too. You know, as you rise up the the rank structure in the military, especially in today's military, you see less and less of the battlefield. You see right. less and less of combat. Mm. Once you get beyond the rank of like captain, you're really not leading soldiers in combat. It's, can, it's not as common. Can you get promoted for stuff you do on the battlefield, like getting a medal of honor? They're like, all right, well, you're a general now. You can. It doesn't really happen anymore. Mm -hmm. It was it was a lot more common in past conflicts, but it really doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. To uh, put in perspective, too, um, when Cons was saying less than 0.08% receive it, mm -hmm. um, college athletes, less than 2% go pro. So that's an even right. tighter wow. number. I, right. That's pretty crazy. I like that yeah. fact. Uh, the one Coast Guard guy was a stud, Douglas Monroe. I'm going to give the Coast Guard shine right now. It's the only time I'm going to give him shine on this. By the way, the Space Force hasn't had one yet. Zero. They Pick will. it up, Space Force. Force. Yeah, they haven't they gotten will. anything yet. So we need like some meteors to be destroyed uh this guy named douglas monroe we'd gotten to see uh, a duplicate of his medal at the douglas monroe barracks at the coast guard training academy in cape may new jersey a lovely cape may new jersey mm. by the way my Did first time there when i was with annie and mick we went to the 
Coast Guard Training Academy there, which is essentially Guantanamo, Be- no, uh, Paris <laughs> Island, Paris Island for Coast Guard. Everyone yes. goes through there. Yes. And it's awesome. It's awesome. We, Annie was driving a cutter. She was doing something called 40 knots, which I learned was way too fucking, way too fast. Um, the people there were awesome. And Cape May is awesome. Yeah. Cape well, May is I a mean, great little town. The Coast Guard and the Navy, it's kind of a cheat code because they got to be by water, right? So by and large, where you could be stationed in either of those branches is usually pretty good. Yes. Yeah. Do they, they, do they fully embrace the movie The Guardian with Bro, Ashton Kutcher in the Coast Guard? I have been trying to get Kate and Chaps to watch The Guardian going on five years now. <laughs> Kevin, Great movie. Kevin Costner doesn't miss. Yeah. Like yes. That's what you yeah. need to understand. They have it playing on a loop. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love yes. that movie. Yes. No, they, what's the other movie they have? Uh, the, the Coast Guard? There was two yeah, Coast Guard was... movies. You're right. And one of them was The Guardian. The other one... I can't think of the name of it. Cuba no, Gooding Jr. Is he the one? No, no, no that was it's in the like Navy. From the, oh, that's it's, Navy it Seals. Made, maybe in the 80s? Snow Dogs. I don't know. I, but they did. <laughs> it was somebody's I, name. I can't think of it. I feel bad that mention, I can't think of it. They did mention like both of them. It right this now. guy... Finest made, Hours? That's it. Maybe, yeah. Maybe. Exactly 2016. Craig Gillespie? Yes. Mm. Uh, Chris Pine is in it? Yes. Oh, I might have to check this out. Yeah. Maybe that's it. Was it him or his dad? I, don't know. I think I think it was handsome. Christian. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. I took a left turn. I, don't, but I, I just I want love, to know. I love this left turns. I'm about the, to go on one. The Coast Guard needs to embrace it. I feel like the, I feel it like the awesome. army is kind of making it. Their like recruitment videos look like Modern Warfare too. Yeah. I think the Coast Guard needs to embrace the Ashton Kutcher, Kevin Costner. They do. They do. I, good. Good. I, I, I mean, look what the, look what happened with the Navy's recruitment numbers back in the '80s when Top Gun came out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Massive, massive influx of recruits. And, and then when the it, when the sequel came out, nothing. No. Well, all my boys, they they all were trying to be Top Gun, and only one of them got into the school or whatever it was to be able to do it. I'll tell you what's even more impressive, and something that like we talk about it jokingly, not jokingly, but flippantly, how people join the Navy after Top Gun, and you know how maybe after the finest hours you're more likely to go to the Coast Guard. What floors me is how many of these uh, Medal of Honor stories happened because they saw uh, Pearl Harbor get bombed and they were like, I don't give a shit. I'm 13 years old. I want to go to war. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a different time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know what needs to happen because I sat here uh, during 9-11, right? And, and I, you know, we didn't see that type of, you know, our, our Pearl Harbor, right? I'm not being disrespectful no, to victims of Pearl Harbor or whatever, but it seems like back then, People were like, Annie, get your gun. Let's go. You know, I mean, wasn't the, the, I'll the, slightly disagree with that. Okay. I, I think if you talk to a lot of service members in the last 20 years, mm. a lot of them will point to 9 11 as the reason what I, prompted I, them to serve. I don't Maybe doubt it's, it. It's not, but it's, it's a not size to the extent. Thing. Yes. Yeah. It's so, not to the extent that it was in, in 1941. Right. But it, there was a fervor for uh, pride in mm-hmm. being an American and defending our country. So, which is, which is but, absolutely beautiful, but it's, I mean, they had similar slogans. It was a day that will live in infamy, never forget. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, they, yeah. It, it, they're huge. Yeah. yeah. And so I have a lot of respect. I, I have a lot of respect for cons. I'm going to joke around with them and stuff like that. He's not a good guy. But I, I, I just, I, I'm in awe with a lot of this shit. Douglas Monroe, the only Coast Guard guy that I'm going to talk about, he was in charge of a group of 24 Higgins boats. Higgins boats should raise a, uh, a familiarity with people who listen to this podcast. He engaged in the evacuation of a battalion of 500 Marines trapped by uh, enemy Japanese forces at Point Cruz, Guadalcanal in 1942. That's what this guy did. He brought in the Higgins boats, and it was under constant strafing by enemy machine gun fire. He uh, daringly led five of his small craft towards the shore. As he closed the beach, he signaled the others to land. And then in order to draw the enemy's fire and protect heavily loaded boats, he valiantly placed his craft with its two small guns as a shield between the beachhead and the Japanese. When the evacuation was nearly completed, Monroe was killed by enemy fire, but his crew carried on until the last boat was loaded and cleared the beach. That's a stud. That, that's a stud to go in and get people off the beach at Guadalcanal. Um, his mother was awarded the uh, medal posthum- uh, posthumously. She was awarded it uh, on behalf of the recipient, her son. And like I had said, there's a, uh, a FDR had given it to the, uh, to the old lady, to his mother, Edith Monroe. And there's a duplicate of the medal on display, as I had said, in Cape May, New Jersey. Um, I, I'm going to make a full left turn here because Higgins Boat's Twisted History of New Orleans was June of New Orleans was June of mm-hmm. 2021. 
I can't believe it's June of 2020. It's almost you, two years. Since you guys went down to the World War II Museum. It's exactly it. Oh, that's amazing. a great place. I've been it's there. It's my favorite museum in the world. So I'm really? mentioning it again, even for the woman who's listening on four times speed. If you're hearing it again for the second time, I really don't care. You should get your ass down to the uh, World War II Museum in New Orleans. It's awesome. In 1926, a guy named Andrew Higgins was the founder of Higgins Industries, a New Orleans-based New Orleans -based lumber company, and more importantly, a boat manufacturer. And he designed something, something called the Eureka Boat. And it was a shallow draft craft used by oil drillers and trappers in the lower Mississippi. The way this uh, craft was made was to operate uh, in shallow waters. Like mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. propeller is inside the hull, all this stuff that made it um, perfect for uh, oil drillers and whatnot. Um, as he designed a spoonbill bow for his craft, he allowed it to be run onto riverbanks and then back off of them with ease. Along comes the Marine Corps, who are interested in finding better ways to get men across a beach in an amphibious landing, so they expressed interest in the Eureka boat. So then this guy Higgins had stole some designs from the Japanese, because the only thing that was the problem with his Eureka boat was you had to jump off the sides. Sure. So he had found a Japanese design where they were able to drop the front. So now he combined the Japanese design with the Eureka body, the Japanese design bow with the Eureka body, and that became the Higgins boat. And the Higgins boat, as you guys know, you saw storm the beaches in Normandy and all those kind of things. It was because of him. And blah, 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 blah. Hold on. If it wasn't for those Higgins boats that were used to storm the beaches with Normandy during World War II... Higgins boats were also called LCVPs, Landing Craft Vehicle Personnel. It could carry 36 soldiers, and over 23,000 boats were produced during the war. And by September of 1943, 12,900 of the American Navy's vessels, their 14, 12,900 of the 14,000 Navy vessels were designed by Higgins Industries. Hmm. That's huge. So I'll put it another way. 92% of the U.S. Navy was the Higgins Navy. Uh, Eisenhower is quoted as saying, Andrew Higgins is the man who won the war for us. If Higgins had not designed and built those LCVPs, we could never have landed over an open beach. The whole strategy of the war would have been different. And then some guy named Adolf Hitler recognized Higgins and bitterly dubbed him as the new Noah. And because he's a New Orleans guy and that's where his industry was, that's why the uh, WW2 Museum is in New Orleans. I actually never knew that. Yeah. So Higgins Boats, obviously the Monroe uh, story uh, centered around them. And then the Andrew Higgins things goes a little bit more uh, deeper. I was going to say with the Higgins Boat, I understand they go up on the beach. They drop the platform. Right. And you can have like a, a Jeep or a little tank roll out. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't it have made more sense for the – Thing to open up from behind and the guys like pull out in two lines and go that way because I, I feel like in d-day and everything i've seen they just like open the flap down and they're just completely uh exposed to machine gun yeah. fire I, well i didn't think i'd come on this show and just have vibs just completely crap all over everybody who landed yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, andrew higgins what's up with his design <laughs> right well i think i think first off and again we're we're just chatting about it because that's what we do uh, it drops them off in shallower water, yeah. right? Because you're going towards the shore, right. or on the beach, which is what they want. Yeah. And then you can back up off it because of like that that hull design. Um, I guess there's a there's an argument they could have banged the Yui and backed in like Annie does to all these like <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, do a quick K turn. <laughs> it's safe. Um, I tell you what, Vibs, if you ever get a chance to go to the World War II Museum down in Louisiana, yeah. you should look up a woman named Sarah Kirksey. She's the director of operations uh -huh. there. And she's she's actually a fantastic follow Ooh. on Twitter, Sarah uh -huh. at Sarah Kirksey underscore. She's amazing, and she'll give you like she breaks it down exactly why. Like they have a whole entire exhibit dedicated to why they did it that way. Okay, it's I, I don't want to give it away because it really. Go I, guess, I guess they would have to go out and swim a little bit to get because yeah. the water isn't. I believe they could do I it just, either way. Right, because also you got to remember, Vibs, they're not you know wearing a swimsuit. Right. You know, they got a lot they got of gear. 50 pounds of gear strapped to their back right. and yeah. a weapon. Yeah. Yeah. You know another thing know. about Sarah Kirksey? <laughs> no, not this no, one. No, no, not no, this no. one. No. Not this one. No. Easy, JC. No, yeah, no. JC. <laughs> no, she's, she's incredible, and she does a fantastic job down there, mm -hmm. and she really goes out of her way to, like, really mm -hmm. um, spotlight a lot of people. Like, this 
if you go to her Twitter page today, she's got an old Navy guy on there. He's just the cutest thing ever. Oh, really? I, yeah. I, I appreciate you taking some of the heat off me there, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Just, oh, my gosh. <laughs> like <laughs> no, but you should really go to that museum. I would love to. I, yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a there's a World War II museum in Indy that I've been yeah. to. It was great. Uh, we went with we went with uh, Mincy. We oh, that's interesting. Mincy, yeah. Mincy and his girlfriend. Well, him and Sarah are very, they're yeah. very friendly. They're very close friends. What's up, Guadalcanal? <laughs> this awesome. place is amazing. I was so impressed by it. Yeah. Mincy was awesome, too. Uh, and again, if you I go to him. New Orleans, do it with Mincy. He's the king of New Orleans. <laughs> Guy is awesome. King of the South. Uh, yeah. You can't go anywhere without somebody uh, knowing awesome. him on the street. Wow. And he knows all the spots, all the food places and stuff. Yeah. It's, it, honest to God. And the girl he was dating at the time was an absolute goddamn yeah, sweetheart. Okay. And so, we, yeah, we had. We had a couple of good uh, good meals on there. Uh, back to the metal facts. The Stolen Valor Act of 2005 and 2013 makes it illegal to buy or sell a Medal of Honor. Mm. So if somebody has it, they were given it to them by a relative or something like that. You can't buy or sell it. You can't buy its ribbon. You can't buy its rosette. And that's including replicas or reproductions. You can't trade those either. So if you have a replica of the Medal of Honor that you bought, you broke the law. There are no classified or secret Medal of Honor recipients. That Pre- we know of. Yeah, presentation well, of the Medal of Honor. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt, 1905's executive order, stated that the presentation of the Medal of Honor will always be made with formal and impressive ceremonial. Therefore, they're always presented publicly. publicly. And surprisingly, only 18.5% of Medals of Honor have been awarded posthumously. So over 80% of the people who have gotten them have gotten them in person. That's fucking wild. Mm-hmm. This is my language. I thought there would be a lot more posthumous things, but less than 20% of the Medals of Honor are awarded posthumously. Is it, is it because if they, they pass away, there's usually not like witnesses to it? Like, I would um, think so. I mean, I, that, that certainly can be part of it. I mean, there's a lot of people who are dead on battlefields who every witness around them is probably dead, but they did something just as valiant to win a Medal of Honor. It's not like they're going to stop in the middle of what they're doing and be like, note this guy. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah. take note of that, Judd. (laughs) Or or technology didn't exist then. It wasn't Mm -hmm. like they had a cell phone in their pocket Mm -hmm. where they could just screenshot it like they do now. Like, these guys were in the throes of it. Is there there ever any feelings of not wanting it? Like... Mm. Like if you lose guilt? your friends, yeah, or maybe some survivors' you know? guilt. I yeah. would imagine. I, I would have to imagine that you know I've I've never uh, received one. We've been fortunate enough to to interview a, a bunch of them on uh, Zero Blog Thirty, and I think there is part of that because oftentimes in these situations, there are a lot of service members that lose their life in in you know the face of all this danger and in the face of this gallantry that these uh, individuals demonstrate. It's usually at the cost of other people's lives. So I think. In some ways, it might feel like a burden. In others, it's a tremendous honor. And, and I will say, and you'll talk about Kyle Carpenter. Mm-hmm. Kyle has said what an immense responsibility he mm-hmm. feels to honor the legacy of all those other men who have been awarded uh, the medal and to really live for those service members that didn't come home. I Googled who has turned down the Medal of Honor, thinking that there was somebody, it was either... One of those things where it was too painful, like you said, or it was like a Marlon Brando moment where I don't want the Academy Award. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and so I was, and I did. Who turned down the Medal of Honor? And this is what I got. Bill Belichick, coach of the New England Patriots, turned down the medal after the 2021 United States Capitol attack. Hold on. Country musician Dolly Parton turned down the medal twice. Parton said she turned it down the first time because her husband was ill and the second time because of the COVID pandemic. But Google fucked up. Google had messed up Presidential Medal of Freedom yes. yeah. versus the Medal of Honor, which is a joke, yeah. right? Compared, Bill Cosby has a Presidential Medal of Freedom, yeah. so I'm turning down mine too, yeah. right? Is, is yeah. that that's where, the whole thing. Where, where Obama's putting it on Ellen and she's crying? Yeah, yeah. I think yeah it's okay. like at the Kennedy Center <laughs> yeah. and yeah. stuff. But what an absolute <sighs> gaffe by Google on that mm-hmm. one, because it blew my mind. I, I had the same exact thought process, Jack. I was like, who turned it down? And I was like, Bill Belichick. Uh, what don't I? I didn't know about Chuck Knoll. Like we had to go back and talk about. Did Belichick like storm the beaches somewhere? <laughs> he didn't. He did not. No, he just is a sweatshirt. grumpy no. guy with a, a torn up sweatshirt. I mean, but also to your point, I, I bet you there are loads of stories in the last 200 plus years of people who are probably deserving. And, you know, maybe the witnesses didn't make it out of that battle. No. So they had no one to, um, you know, be able to corroborate what happened. Or, you know, there were some people who probably said, don't tell anybody about that. Right. I have to imagine that occurred. Yeah. And I'd imagine there's thousands of them in a drawer somewhere where people don't want anyone to see. Mm-hmm. Like I'd have them above my man. I'd have it above my mantle rather, 
for people to see, but I'm sure, like, to your point, if you were to walk by it, it on your mantle every day, it brings back a tremendous amount of uh, PTSD. I know, of course. I know in Viet- Vietnam, a lot of people protested by throwing away their medals. Is that the first war where people, soldiers, were kind of like, I don't, I don't want this piece of tin? Yeah. Uh, maybe. Um, you know, because prior to that, it was kind of a, a respectable, like, r- well, there was, there, uh, you believed in the country going to war. And this was the first time I feel like people were like, ah, is this well, just? Well, yeah. I mean, it was, the Viet- this is a whole other twist in history. Yeah, yeah. Why, why did we go to Vietnam? What was the, the point of doing right. that? I'm trying to learn today. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're going to get it you all. Know, and then you also have the, the Forgotten War, the Korean War. Yeah. Where, yeah. You know, folks just don't tend to talk about it because they didn't necessarily fully understand what we were doing there. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I mean, I think that's on a case-by-case basis. But yeah. the medals are, are given based on how you treat your the soldiers with you it's not so much why you're at the war so i never really understood like to viv's point like why they would throw them away Mm -hmm. like why would they protest because it wasn't you didn't get it for going to the war you got what you did for your for your troop while you were there right that makes a lot of sense yeah it wasn't your decision to be in vietnam to use your example but but it's what you did there for your like you know i if you know, it feels silly saying teammates, but that's what you are. You're a team, right? No, like, and what's it, the, what's yeah, the they used the word comrade a bunch comrade. when we were doing the research know. with this. I, I like, yeah. I thought that was weird. Is yeah. that more used than I would think? No, uh, no, okay, <laughs> yeah. maybe it's just for this. What did you, what did you call them? Um, your troop, your platoon. What did you, ref, what do you refer to your men as? Obviously, other than men, you these know, are my, my men. I gotta take care my of my men, my squad, my platoon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, never comrades. No, I, I wouldn't think. Yeah. 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 My Russia. Russia. We, a lot of times we say my soldiers, you know, right. our soldiers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. All right. I'm going to use comrades a lot. I don't care. Okay. It's, it's just the ultimate. It is the ultimate team thing. If you right. don't do your job, you're dead mm-hmm. or you right. endanger other people. It's like, do your job. That's what Bill Belichick always preaches. Do your job. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it always it's, goes it's, back it's, to Belichick. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to get into a couple of specifics, but if you want to drill down again to see who's the first – Jewish recipient, first black recipient, Native American soul, first Asian to win. By the way, the first Native American guy to, to win, win. Uh, to re- receive <laughs> it, uh, his nickname was Mad Bear. That's a good That's nickname. Awesome. That's a good name. Native American the, soldier, oh, your yeah. nickname's Mad Bear. I got a couple of terrible nicknames coming up. <laughs> Mad Prequel good. to Cocaine Bear, Mad Bear. <laughs> yeah. But again, C-M-O-H-S dot org. And you can actually see the graph of, it's a striking graph because the most medals were obviously given out uh, during the Civil War. Or maybe not, obviously, I don't know if I mentioned it yet. And then the precipitous drop-off and how it's gotten less and less, um, as you had made. Um, as matters dictate, I'll touch on women first, because I love the ladies. The only woman to receive the Medal of Honor was Dr. Mary Edwards Walker. And she wasn't a soldier. She was a civilian. Ah. It's 1865 for her efforts to treat the wounded in battle and across enemy lines during the Civil War. She was captured by the Confederate forces after crossing enemy lines to treat wounded civilians, and she was arrested as a spy. She was sent as a prisoner of war to Richmond, Virginia, until released in a prisoner exchange. Um, Her Medal of Honor was rescinded. Right, so following the 1916-1917 review of uh, Medal of Honor awards. And she was a civilian at the time of her valor. Valor, it was rescinded. She refused to give her medal back. And she yeah. wrote every day until she died in 1918. Oh, yeah. Interesting. They yeah. took it away 60 years later. 1916, Congress asked that all medals. Uh, yeah. yeah. 1916, Congress asked that all medals awarded up to that point be reviewed to ensure that they met the high standards required for the award. As a result, 911 medals of honor were rescinded. 900, and a lot of them from civilians. Mm-hmm. Only six were given back by Jimmy Carter in 1977. And uh, posthumously, obviously, forever, no one lived. And Mary's was one of those. Yeah. Mm. So Mary had it taken away in 16, and she was like, I'm not giving it back. And she died with it. And then Jimmy Carter uh, uh, give it, uh, re- uh, reinstated it posthumously in 1977. So, yeah, so that's, that's pretty that wild. number is minus 905. For the record, I'd like it to away. be noted that Jimmy Carter's already in hospice. So yeah. we did not do anything. To oh, his- Jimmy Carter's going to die because of us? He, I'm saying he's I'm not. Still a lot he's of Betty already. White uh, yeah. He's already in hospice. So he's in hospice. They we did nothing to him. Right. The fate is. You should not be buying any green bananas. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> uh, the young. Uh, so another stat: the youngest to ever receive the award was 11-year-old <laughs> Willie Johnston, and this is where I think a little bit of difference between after 9/11. Yeah. Uh, he was an army musician during the Civil War. This this wasn't obviously uh, World War II. Army musicians, you don't see a lot. Yeah. He was a drummer boy. Hell yeah. Mm. 
And Drummer Boys to us is an absolute joke. I don't appreciate you know those those you know battle scenes with a fife and a and a this <laughs> and a that. I just think they're silly. Nah, it wasn't silly silly at all. I think it's sick. They're that's head awesome. bandaged up. Yeah. It, before you had like phones or anything, like that's your pump up. We're, we're going into music. We're like, going into a sick beat. Yeah. yeah. Like, when an right. officer, let's ride. When an officer's orders were muffled by gunfire, the beats of the drum yeah. or the drum calls signaled actionable commands. That, yeah. Th- they they were not for show. It was yeah. to I've never help knew. them advance. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't just for the pictures. All right. Yeah. So this guy's kind. Of a stud. It's wait, wait. So it wasn't for pictures, but did did was it also for the pump up too? Like, hey, this is no, like how people like hit <laughs> no, their was, shields. No, it was it was completely uh, just for making calls. Yes. They didn't flags weren't as Ladies sound was easier than like waving flags. Yes. When you're learning about the American <laughs> Revolution in school, that's something they should really discuss more. They never. I should know. I bet you most teachers don't know it. Yeah. They don't know, but yeah. that's like that should be. This is one of the episodes that should be played in a well, class. That's why I'm trying not to curse, and I've cursed know. already. Um, I've texted you. I've signaled you. Yeah. When you're watching, <laughs> when you're watching movies, it's always like you have the drummer boy who has his head bandaged up and the fife right. guy, and they're like leading the team yeah. into battle, and that's all you see. You don't like see the right. operational stuff on the battlefield. Yeah, like even the bagpipers too. You sometimes mm-hmm. see. So anyway, it was provide guidance amid the chaos of warfare. It's a pretty cool. So that's what Drummer Boys did. Willie participated. Eleven-year-old Willie participated in the Seven Days Battle, a series of conflicts fought in 1862, where Confederate General Robert E. Lee and his troops forced Willie's Union side to retreat down the Virginia Peninsula. So this was in a losing campaign. But while the Union Army fled the area, every soldier and every musician dropped their weapons and their instruments to make a quicker escape, except for Willie. Let's go. Willie, the 11-year-old, was the only one who kept his drum. (laughs) So when they got back to whatever, go to whatever point B, and the only person who had his thing was this little Willie guy. Uh, Upon learning of his actions, President Abraham Lincoln, heard of him, recommended the young drummer boy for the Medal of Honor, which he received at 13 years of age, for actions rendered when he was only 11. That's stud. That's that's. I mean, I know everybody here knows who I don't know knows members of Migos. Everybody should know who Willie Johnson is. Yeah. People, people love to like be like, oh, kids and violence in video games. Imagine what being on a Civil War battlefield would do to you oh, at eleven. Seven days <laughs> battle uh, when you're just trying to keep the beat to tell yeah. people, you know, we um, need the movie. Flank, flank yeah, flank right, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this is the guy who I alluded to before when I said uh, 14-year-old Jack Lucas, right? One more kid. We're going to do one more kid. Uh, he falsified his age, uh, pretended to be 17 when he enlisted in the Marines. He's 14 years old. Uh, he was trained <laughs> He was trained as a heavy m- machine gun crew member and stationed in North Carolina. He was still a half a world away from the war, but he was determined to see combat. His real age eventually was found out by the Marines, so before he was sent into battle, he was reassigned as a truck driver. I think in Hawaii, he was sending letters back to his like 15-year-old girlfriend. <laughs> and they yeah. were talking about, like, how wild is it? I'm 14 and I'm working. So the Marines censor some mail, yeah. so they found out, and they're like, you're done. You can drive, you can drive a truck, by the way. 14-year-old driving a truck yeah. first, but you can't go to war. It was a pack of cigs. <laughs> but he had an itch to go to action, so he snuck on a Navy transport ship. The USS Duell, set for Iwo Jima, <laughs> while on board, right before the 30-day AWOL thing, like you have 30 days before you're officially yep. AWOL or a deserter, he had turned himself in and volunteered to fight in order to not be cited as a deserter. Like 29 days, he's like, nope, I've been in the galley, and they couldn't turn around to drop the kid off, mm-hmm. so they sent him into battle. And that's awesome, right? So he was reassigned as a rifleman with the Charlie Co- with Charlie Company First Battalion, Twenty Sixth Marines. I never give these things enough credit, so I'm going to try and get those right every time. I have no idea what Charlie Company is. I have no idea what the First Battalion is, and I have no idea what Twenty Sixth Marines is. It's just organizational structure. 
That's yes, all it is. but like I could just say he was reassigned, reassigned as a rifleman with the Marines. But I think yeah. it's cool as shit that this 14 year old kid was Charlie Company. Is absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what it is. You know what I mean? No, I mean I think everybody takes a lot of pride though too, and I yeah. think there are certain units that have distinguished themselves over the course of American history in battle, mm-hmm. so they're more well known. You talk about the Medal of Honor, you know, the 442nd in World War II. Mm-hmm. I believe you, somebody can fact check me has more Medal of Honors, Medals of Honor than any other unit in American military history. So the importance is there yeah. to distinguish different units. They're the Weymouth, Massachusetts. Yeah. Of uh, right, yeah. right, right, right. Uh, so- the hundredth and 442nd. Yes, you said. Yep, yep. that's it. Yep. What is what you just said? The most medals were at were the what is it? The four forty second. Four forty second. Yeah. Who's the most, not infamous, but well known group? Would it be the one hundred first Airborne? Just because of what? Uh, Band of Brothers. P- uh, yeah, Band yeah. of Brothers. Yeah, pro- in, in our country's just uh, colloquialisms. Yeah, one hundred first is probably you know the most well known just yeah. because of that you know the movie. I, um, I, I I I also understand most of my knowledge comes from Hollywood movies, so right. I, yeah. I, I then, apologize to everybody. In that regard, you know. A lot of most people know the Ranger Battalions, the different Ranger Battalions, mm. the different special forces groups, obviously, uh, you know, you know, different teams within the SEAL uh, organization. So, SEAL team. It's, it, yeah, the six is that? Yes. Yeah, that's there's modern, you know, six, yeah. three, you know, all, on down the line. And, um, you know, why SEAL Team Six is six because there were six of them. No, well, no, because there weren't actually six of them. But <laughs> the, the gentleman who, who started the, the SEAL teams, he wanted the enemy to think. That they there were more of them than there actually were, so he's like, oh, there's, we're, we're SEAL Team Six, so they thought there were five others, and it, there really it's weren't. It's like the senior prank where you get three pigs and you put one, yeah. two, and four on them, and you let them in the school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. not to compare. God, no, I, no, I feel like I'm doing bad on this episode. Same, <laughs> Our military same, is pigs. All right? yeah, babe, same general concept. You're yeah, not wrong. Yeah. Right. Just disrespectful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> hey, we're gonna we're gonna get some hate clips going yeah, viral. Yeah. So, get, so get back to Jack Lucas. He was 14 when he enlisted illegally. He trained for a couple of years. He hopped on a boat to Iwo Jima. He's now he celebrated his 17th birthday, en route to the deadliest battle in Marine Corps history. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. My 17th birthday I had a bottle of blackberry brandy, and I oh. Sorry, He's, speaking of Iwo Jima, we had a guest one time. His name was Stanley Rubin, and this is the early days of Zero Blog 30. Mm-hmm. This gentleman, we had to split it into two episodes. He was 92 at the time. Wow. And Chaps and I, ultimately, we just kind of sat back and listened. We stopped asking questions. He had a notebook in front of him, and he took us step by step of what happened to him during that battle. It was easily, you know, you say the name Stanley Rubin, and, and nobody knows who Never Stanley Rubin is. Yeah. You listen to this, and you're like, whoa. Right. That's powerful. It's, it's. Did he keep a journal, or does that a, is that a reflection? I think that was his reflection. I don't think he had a journal because you're not cause pulling like, out a pen impressive. and paper during Iwo Jima, the Battle of Iwo Jima. He just went and he wanted to make sure he didn't miss anything, so he wrote down all his notes and he just deliberately told us his story, um, and it was unbelievable. I did um, that with nine eleven. Yeah, the days right after because I right. felt like if I didn't. It was. I would never remember. I right. was going to bury it so deep. Yes, yeah, so I don't we know don't when talk he wrote about it. it. We we yeah. didn't talk about it, and until he wrote his blog, how many years later, yeah. we didn't talk about it. Mm-hmm. I mean, like there were issues that we, you know would come up that we would discuss it, but that and I never looked at that. I don't think I've gone back to that journal even when we did Kevin's show. Right. Mm-hmm. That was yeah. going to be my next question. What Do you think he did that on his own, wrote it down, or do you think it was like a therapy, like, hey, it'll help if you go? My guess is he did it on his own at yeah, some point. Yeah. It might have been for our show. I don't know. I never actually asked the, his, his grandson. Was he a Medal course. of Honor recipient? No, he wasn't. No, no he wasn't. Did he win any other so ones? Who cares? I, I, think, <laughs> I think he was awarded some different awards, but uh, not the Medal Apologies. of Honor. Apologies. What's his name? I would name? love to go back Stanley and Rubin. Rubin. Stanley Rubin. If you, uh, yeah, if you Google Stanley Rubin, Zero Blog 30, I love those episode. old times. Yeah, absolutely. Because they have such, yeah. um, they have so much passion when they're, it, or when they're speaking about mm-hmm. what they went through and they have such a love for the guys they yeah. served with. Yes. That, that was a good part of, and I know I go back to Band of Brothers, when they do bring the old guys. Thank in. you yes. for referencing yes. something yes. that is probably not real. I appreciate <laughs> it. <laughs> but Jack Lucas, so he celebrated his 17th birthday en route to, again, the deadliest battle in Marine Corps history. He landed with the second wave on Iwo Jima and immediately pushed inland. This was D-Day plus two. His fire team attacked a series of enemy pillboxes, bounding from one trench to the other and engaging Japanese soldiers. At one point, his rifle jammed. He looked down to fix the malfunction. He saw two enemy grenades sitting at his feet. He said, get out of here 
here to his friends without hesitation, and then he jumped on the, one of the grenades before it detonated beneath him. His injuries were so severe that his fire team thought he was dead, and they continued to press on. Luckily, another U.S. outfit was moving up behind him, and he had the wherewithal to just keep his fingers wiggling. And that's the only reason they were able to see that he wasn't wow. dead. Right? He was eventually discovered alive and evacuated. So this, that's so that's a cool story. Fourteen-year-old kid goes to Jim at seventeen, gets blown up, wiggles his. This is the reason I put it in there, Vibs, because I love. Remember, I had you. Remember the other uh, young soldier. And I had us read like a script or something. Yes. Where, where, where he was signing up. He was like, you better let me go in. See, like, you know. <laughs> so this 17 year old punk on October 5th, 1945, President Harry Truman awarded Lucas the Medal of Honor. And he did it in person. And this is what Lucas said, 17 year old kid. Of course, I had to go home to see my girlfriend and get some lip sugar. Oh. I love that. But Mr. Truman called me That's and interrupted awesome. my plans. That's what this 17 year old punk That's cool. hero who jumped on a grenade. That's I had awesome. to go home to see my girlfriend and get some lip sugar. Hell yeah. But Truman called me and interrupted my plans. That's Lucas great. left the Marines after the war. After the <laughs> war, he was 17, but his actions at Iwo Jima made him the youngest Medal of Honor recipient since the Civil War and Willie Johnston. Yeah. Wow. You know who's going to steal fuck, that? Yeah. Taylor Lewan's going to steal cool, that with man. his big hugs, little kisses. Yeah. Now he's going to call it lip sugar. Oh, give me some <laughs> lip sugar. Where was, was he gonna, from? I'm trying to. F- do we know where Jack Lucas was from? I don't know. Jack I don't Lucas. know. Jack Lucas. I want to get his. I want to know what his accent was. <laughs> yeah. I go to my girlfriend we'll and get some clip. lip we'll sugar. Hey, you oh, know what? He's from Massachusetts. Oh, Mississippi. Never mind. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Wait. That's a stick. We're gonna Plymouth, do a North Carolina. With it, South. Okay. Okay. But lip sugar, he, as far as I'm concerned, he's a 14 year old kid from Chicago. I got to yeah. go definitely, get some lip sugar. I'm definitely <laughs> taking lip sugar. Oh, yeah. Oh, so yes. am I. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, Truman, like, you know, that's, uh, that's awesome. I'm going to mention somebody, uh, and I'll go around. If anybody else wants to mention people, I certainly will. But I like what ultimately happened with this one guy. His name was uh, General Smedley Butler. Yep. He was a Marine. Terrible first name. Smedley's a terrible first name. No, you yeah. can't really escape that. Oh, my God. Smedley, what are you doing? Yeah. His middle name was Darlington. Smedley Darlington Butler. What? Darlington was his mom's maiden name. So I, I've, okay. even like Darlington Butler would be kind of... You know, he's like you play paddle with him, but Schmedley <laughs> Darlington Butler. <laughs> Schmedley, yeah. what oh. is your malfunction? Yeah. Yeah. And like he was from Pennsylvania, so his nickname was the Fighting Quaker. That's an awful nickname. Yeah. I don't think that's as bad oh, as you I think, think it is. Oh, it's terrible. You, you don't know what you're talking about with nicknames. When, when it comes from your neighborhood and he's your guy and he represents yeah. you yeah. and you're a Quaker. A fighting it, he Quaker. He feels like a guy that like you rock, paper, scissors over. It's <laughs> like, all right, who's taking Quaker. Schmegley? <laughs> yeah. Schmegley? Schmegley? Whatever his name is. Yeah, Schmegley. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Why would you put, sh- why would you put respect right. on this yeah. man's yeah. name? I'll tell you. Uh, he was a double Medal of Honor recipient. How you feel now, Jack? Jerk. And he's one of the most popular military generals in U.S. history. Uh, he came from a long line of politicians. The house he grew up in is av- is uh, actually a historic, you know... Landmark? S- yeah, because all his all his uncles and his dad and stuff were pretty famous politicians. But he decided to take a different route. He lied about his age to enlist in the Marines when he was only 16. He served 34 years in the Marine Corps, had a role in the, in the Spanish-American War in Cuba, the Philippine-American War in Manila, the Boxer Rebellion in China, the Banana Wars in the Caribbean, the Mexican Revolution, and World War One. Wow. <laughs> he knows war. Oh, oh, man. Fighting Quaker. Oh, my God. That's I can't crazy. do a chin right? up. Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to come around on it now. You're right. Butler's first Medal of Honor was earned during the Mexican Revolution. He fought block to block in the streets of Veracruz to rid the city of resistance. His second award occurred a year later in 1915 when his Marines engaged in hand-to-hand combat with the Caicos resistance, a, quote, lower society of miscreants. I think this guy might be canceled. Mm. Now, otherwise, like, who formed a gang to wreak havoc in Haiti. He recalled later that during his time in Haiti, he and his troops hunted the Caicos like pigs. Jeez. Whoa. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was a different time. Yeah, yeah I know. Yeah. Thank you for your service, Butler, but you, you loved war a little too much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He introduced the Marine Corps to their first unofficial mascot, uh, a bulldog named Jiggs, uh-huh. who's still there. So he was the, so the bulldog, like my Uncle Terry had the bulldog. He was Marine mm-hmm. in Vietnam. So in 1922, he started a tradition with uh, the bulldog mascots for the Marines. All the following mascots being awarded a service contract for life with only three officially listed duties. That's all the Marine Bulldogs have to do. Sit, stay, and lie down. 
That's, that's a pretty cool deal. Yeah, that's yeah, a dream. That's basically, all I why do. are yeah. why are bulldogs always picked? Are they really tough? Because I every bulldog I've seen is just drooling and very lazy. Well, yeah. the way that bulldogs are, they are just made, like, so, they should be the French bulldog. Yeah, so they don't stop. Like yeah. I've seen, yeah, I've seen so, t- like sorry terriers that like go into a rat mound yeah. and they are vicious. Yeah, World we War did, One we terriers did it. in the trenches. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were they were something else. But so bulldogs bulldog? were originally were, they were created to bait bulls, right? So what they did was they created their bodies to be all front, no back, and they were able to crouch down below gouging horns. And then they actually had the lock jaws similar to what we know as pit bulls, yeah. so they'd be able to come up and grab onto a bull's neck. And then when the bull would shake them, because their asses were so small, their backs wouldn't snap, so they wouldn't snap. So they were purposely bred to take down bulls. Interesting. And That's since crazy. then, since then, since it's just barbaric to have people try to take down bulls with dogs and whatnot, we've created these fat bastard pets that <laughs> I've owned and I've I've slept thousands of hours with. But the original bulldogs, if you saw them, they were almost cartoonish in their size and they were stone cold killers. I had no idea. I just always yeah. thought they were named bulldogs because they were just built like little tough yeah. tanks. So right. Yeah, cool. I'm going to go on with Smedley. Outside the military, he served as director of public safety in Philly. Okay. Yeah, for one year. So he's like a top cop in Philly. Uh, his impact helped establish police reform in a city full of corrupt public officials. This was the 1920s in Philly. So please think about the untouchables. Think about yeah. how the Al capone part of Chicago. This was, this was Philly's answer. It was corrupt as all hell. So they brought in Smedley to clean it up. Instead of being untouchable, he was known as incorruptible. He formed a ragtag group of bandit-chasing police that patrolled in armored cars with radios and carried uh, sawed-off shotguns. This is after serving in all those... You know, bringing a different wars. brand of justice yeah. to Philly. Yeah. yeah. He later said, "Cleaning up Philadelphia's <laughs> vice is worse than any battle I was ever in." Whoa. What does in that 19- say about the trash in Philly? <laughs> yeah. 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 In 1931, he validated he violated diplomatic norms by spreading gossip about Benito Mussolini. There was a, a story that uh, Mussolini struck and killed a child with his automobile, and then just kept going. And so Smedley had heard this. Sergeant Butler or whatever, General Butler had heard this, and he got in trouble for it. The Italian government protested and that piece of shit, President Hoover, my least favorite president, had him court-martialed, making Butler the first general to be placed under arrest since the Civil War. Wow. This guy's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This guy's pretty cool. In 1935, he wrote a book titled War is a Racket. Yep. That's how a lot of people know him mm-hmm. and condemning the profit motive behind warfare. And I want to read this quote because I listed the wars he was involved in at the jump, right? I had said Spanish-American War in Cuba, Philippine-American War in Manila, Boxer Rebellion in China, Banana War in Caribbean, Mexican Revolution in World War One. Here's what he had to say about his service in each one. This is a quote, General Smedley Butler. I spent 33 years and four months in active military service, and during that period I spent most of my time as high-class muscle for big business. In short, I was a racketeer and a gangster for capitalism. This is big balls. I helped make Mexico safe for American oil in 1914. I helped make Haiti and Cuba a decent place for the National City Bank boys to collect revenues. I helped in the raping of a half a dozen Central American republics for the benefit of Wall Street. I helped purify Nicaragua for the International Banking House of Brown Brothers in 1902 to 1912. I brought light to the Dominican Republic for the American sugar interest of 1916. I helped make Honduras right for American fruit companies in 1903. In China in 1927, I helped see to it that Standard Oil went on its way unmolested. Looking back on it... I may have given Al Capone a few hints. The <laughs> best he could do is operate his racket in three districts. I operated on three continents. Holy wow, shit. What a flex. What a, like this what a flex. Right? This is a double Surely. Medal of Honor winner with a terrible first name. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But he overcame that. Yes. He said, first name be damned. I'm yeah. going to go do something. Eisenhower had a similar thing saying the military industrial complex. Yes. Mm-hmm. 25 years later. Right. Smedley was by far the highest ranking officer before him to speak up on that. General Smedley Darlington Butler died in 1940. And at the time of his death, he was the most decorated Marine in U.S. history. I love that. You think they fashioned Jessup after him? I don't know. (laughs) Colonel Nathan Jessup? It's just that you read read his quote exactly how you imitate the movie. Yeah. Really? 
Ah, that's just me. Uh, that's just good stuff. Is that, uh, right? what's his, Nicholas, Nicholson? Jack Nicholson. Jack Nicholson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Here we go. <laughs> Great movie. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt's the only president to receive the Medal of Honor. And uh, Well, he, that's also true because how how many presidents are we up to now? 46? Yeah. How many have served in the military? I think like George George H.W. Bush was pretty respected. Right, right? and shut down. Yeah. yeah. Right? Oh, he's eaten by cannibals. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd give right? it. Uh, maybe he gets it. Mm-hmm. I feel like Teddy. I feel like George H. W. Bush was better Truman. than Teddy's. Truman served in the military. Eisenhower. 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 Me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eisenhower. But, but, yeah. but Teddy Roosevelt was like looking to get injured and like looking for the yeah. the, the accolades. I think George H. W. Bush actually. Like, JFK just, and the Swift Boats. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. I mean, no, there, there's a bunch of them, but uh, I fa- and and he didn't get it till 2001. Which is unfortunate because he died 80 years before that, <laughs> right? But it was his Rough Riders, and, and that's the thing. So, Spanish-American War. He was a colonel in the 1st United States Volunteer Cavalry, even to fight in the Battle of San Juan Hill, mm-hmm. charging up there with his Rough Riders. And it was against orders. So, in total disregard for his personal safety and accompanied by only four or five men, he led his unit in a charge up the hill. He was the first American who made it into the Spanish trenches. It's pretty cool. Yeah, he became man. a war hero. But yeah. people, uh, people resented him for it. People said he rode his white horse from Kettle Hill in San Juan all the way to the White House because it was only three years between him doing that and getting to be vice president uh, for McKinley mm-hmm. right before McKinley was shot and then became president. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, 1898 is when he was in San Juan Hill. 1901, he was, uh, he was VP. And that's what being the governor of uh, New York being wedged in between, right? It's Teddy Roosevelt. That was actually DMX's favorite president, and that's where the Rough Riders came from. <laughs> no, yeah. Little known fact. Little known fact. Yeah, yeah. No, that's Rick Ross. <laughs> yeah. He was nominated during the war, but oh. officials in the Army were upset about his disobedience oh, in yeah. taking the hill. So they, they nixed it. And in 2001, he was finally conser- uh, confirmed by President Bill Clinton. Good on you, Billy. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. I'm going to just do one more Qu- Clinton guy, and then I'll take a little bit of a break. You ever hear of Daniel Inouye? He was one of only seven U.S. senators to receive a Medal of Honor. Yes. Okay. He's a Japanese-American. Mm-hmm. I don't know how many Japanese-Americans have wanted. This guy's cool, Vibs. Uh, he was sent uh, to the European Theater as part of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. That's the, So there's a lot of Japanese-Americans because the 442nd was comprised mainly of Second generation American. Japanese. Yep. If you were a Japanese, you couldn't serve. Yeah. But second generation Japanese Americans were able to serve, so they put them yep. all in the same one. Was 442nd the one you mentioned earlier? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. We're all on the same page. So yes. Daniel Inoue, Inoue, I'll see, he shares a last name of one of the best fighters alive right now, I was part of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, made up mostly of second generation Japanese Americans. His unit was tasked uh, as attacking a part of the Gothic Line a German defense line in Europe. As they attacked, German machine gunners opened fire, pinning them down. So Inouye was shot in the stomach, but he ignored his wounds and destroyed two machine gun nests with grenades before collapsing from blood loss. He came to, began crawling towards the third and final machine gun nest. He was about to throw a grenade into the nest. A German blew his right arm off of his body. (laughs) So uh, he... um, He's, I'll give the quote. He looked down. He saw a clench. He saw clenched in a fist that suddenly didn't belong to me anymore. Was my grenade. Wow. So he used his left hand to grab a grenade out of the right hand that was just blown off his fucking. Excuse me, blown off his goddamn body, and he pried it out, threw it into the nest, and shot at the remaining Germans. Uh, Germans with his Thompson submachine gun, one handed. That's that's a cool story. Uh-huh. So the guy blew. So blew his arm off. And he grabbed his own grenade, threw it. Yeah. He was originally awarded the Distinguished Service Cross, but it was upgraded to the Medal of Honor by President Bill Clinton in 2000. Uh, in 2000. I, I would have just been staring at my arm like, holy shit, that is right. my arm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wanna, I, I say we, we can give him a round of applause because he certainly can't do it himself. He's only got one arm. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. You can do like that bullshit <laughs> thing. But anyway, so that's Daniel anyway. Um, tell me about Kyle Carpenter. You. Oh. Yes. I got the. I was. Yeah. I was. We I were thought filming, you were partnering Vibs. Sorry. We were filming here. We were filming like something I'll never Podfathers. Forget this day, by yeah. The way. And uh, I think you had said you'd come in. You'd be like, I have Kyle Carpenter next door. Yeah. And I was like, awesome. I love Friday Night Lights. Um, I had no idea who Kyle Carpenter was. Who's the guy from Friday Night Kyle Lights? Kyle Chandler. Chandler. Yeah. And uh, I went. In, I went in next door and I met the guy. Guys, one of the most handsome guys you'll ever see. Took your breath away yeah. because uh, not because of. A, 
what he had been through, but yeah. because of what he said to you. Yeah. His face is essentially a jigsaw puzzle because of all the, um, um, well, yeah, I'll, I'll, Cons will tell you what had happened to him. But, you know, one of those guys you know is just devilishly handsome. And, uh, yeah. man, it was a, it was an absolute pleasure. And then I did that, that trite, thank you for your service. And he was like, you and your family are worth it. And I was like, oh, my God. No, we're not. No, we're not. We're pieces of it shit. It changed your day. You right, came right. home a different person that day. No. I, 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 I'm, I'm not saying that. Traffic ticket. I'm not saying that yeah. flippantly nothing. You no. came home. And you were, he was, oh, it was an absolute he was affected pleasure. by it for the, cause it was, I think it was a Friday. Mm -hmm. I want to yeah. say it was a Friday when you had yeah. him in. And that was a day when you guys did Barstool breakfast. Yeah. Uh, like a, um, gentleman's Friday. Oh yeah. And so I, might, I might've been in my feels. It's like, no, I don't, yeah. I don't, it was like bang. right in the middle of it. But I just remember you, you stopped during a break, you called yeah. me and you were, uh, you were shaken by what he had said because, you know, we had been through so much and it just. It affected you very, very so much. So cool. He's the youngest yeah. living Medal of Honor recipient. I think he's 33 right now. Yeah, he was 20 yeah. when he right. performed a, the actions, yeah. what which ultimately, he, he jumped on a grenade. Yeah. He yeah. jumped on a grenade for his, his fellow Marines that he was on, I believe it was a rooftop with, um, and he just, without regard for himself, just jumped on a grenade. Yeah. I don't know how you do that, but he did it. And he wrote a book. Right. He's yes. yeah, the whole deal. His his story is awesome. And his interview with the uh Zero Blog guys is, there goes my, my mic. You can't see you at all. <laughs> I'm glad uh, it moved because you can't. Yep. Yeah, can you move it back? Was a bit? one that you guys uh, should Watch. look up. I would think, right? Yeah, yeah. you should Everything's definitely go apart. check it out. Uh, we had the pleasure of having him on Zero Blog thirty. Are we getting all this? Um, <laughs> I mean I know Kyle Carpenter went through a lot, but I deal with a lot of stuff here too. He uh, he was a guest on Lower in the Bar. Mm -hmm. Was he? Yes, yeah, he was also. Yeah. He's also done a. I'm uh, sorry. What'd you say, Vips? He was a guest on Lowering the Bar. Not only is he Medal of Honor recipient, he was a guest on Lowering the Bar. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a a guest on a uh, pizza review with Dave. Are you? What's right? going on over there? <laughs> don't man? Just shut up. Everybody, this, shut this up. This is his Medal of Honor. We're gonna have moment. to redo that part. <laughs> for for any any Do whatever you want. for he any veteran. So much more. We gotta start yeah. over with him because he's he's amazing. So now, is it the most impressive guy you ever met? Um, it's a loaded question. You've met a lot of guys. Yeah, well, I've been I've been fortunate enough that I've I've met me multiple Medal of Honor recipients, it, mm -hmm. and we've had mul so cool. multiple me Medal of Honor recipients on Zero Blog Thirty. Um, so I don't know that I would um, distinguish him above any of the other ones because I think they're all equally impressive for the reasons that they were awarded the the Medal of Honor. Do you have a favorite? Mine's Smedley Butler. I, and, and listen, this isn't trading cards. No, I, I right. don't think. I don't. But I think we can say there are some stories you like. I can't get the story out of my head that if I saw my arm there with the grenade and then I pick it up and I still launch it and then I start shooting people, I think that's a cool story. I like um, the idea of them being trading cards, um, only because yeah. it's really it should tells be trading their cards. Everybody yeah. should know their story. You won't story. forget yeah. it. Yeah, and, yeah. and it gets well, it out and then, there. And then it some, there are some that have been memorialized in Hollywood. Uh, you know, a few come to mind. Um, the movie Lone Survivor, where mm -hmm. you have Lieutenant Michael Murphy, right. who sacrificed his body to call in to let them uh, know his, their location of that, that SEAL team that was pinned down by the enemy and ultimately saved, um, and I apologize, I'm blanking on his name right now, the, the gentleman who was the survivor. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Um, Marky Mark? Mar no, Marcus. Yeah. Um, Marcus, Marcus Luttrell. Luttrell. Sorry, I sorry, think Marcus. I not his name either. Yes, Marcus Luttrell. Um, so that's one. Uh, another one, there was a, a movie a few uh, years ago, Outpost, and it, it tells the story of Clint Romache. Uh, and, and his Medal of Honor that he received when they were pinned down by 300 enemy uh, Taliban uh, fighters and in Afghanistan. And the enemy had every discernible advantage that you want mm -hmm. in, in battle. And he continuously exposed himself to enemy fire, kept running all over the, the cop. And I actually, one of my teammates from college was in that battle as well and talked about how he was the one calling for fire and, and trying to get them uh, support uh, for that battle. So certainly that's another one that's there. There's a movie that showcases that bravery. Um, you know, another one that comes to mind recently is Alwyn Cash in Iraq, where his vehicle was blown up by an IED and it was on fire. And Alwyn Cash, Sergeant First Class Alwyn Cash, had fuel all over his body and his body became engulfed with flames and i think most people if they were engulfed with flames they would try to put Stop themselves out roll, yeah. no he proceeded to pull every other soldier out of the vehicle wow. to save their lives with 
disregarding his safety and his well-being. And then when they were being evacuated from the incident, he said, take all my soldiers first. He ultimately died, um, you know, from the wounds uh, and the burns. But he, he gave himself so that his, his soldiers could live. Now, just think about that. Yeah. Think about I'm sure we've all at one point or another burned ourselves very slightly. Now think if 80% of your body is literally on fire mm-hmm. and you just continued to, to go forward in the face of that and, and save all those other soldiers' lives. Uh, truly impressive. Um, and then the only other one that I you know always comes to mind, and this is a personal one, why this comes to mind, uh, my grandfather flew with a gentleman named Bernie Fisher, and, and this gentleman was a, a pilot in the Air Force, and, and during Vietnam, there was somebody downed that he landed his plane in, it was either an enemy rice paddy or an enemy airstrip, very, I think it was an enemy airstrip, and it was a very short airstrip, under complete heavy fire, goes, saves that guy, puts him on his plane, and then, you know, flies him to safety. Yeah, so, stud. And that goes to what I was saying about the Air Force, where... You know, you can operate 10, 20, 30,000 feet and you're relatively safe because there's not too many weapons, anti-aircraft weapons uh, certainly come to mind, but not necessarily in every single incident. So you're m- m- largely safe when you're up in safer. a jet. Safer. Safer yeah. when you're in a jet. Certainly there were a lot of jets shot down during Vietnam, uh, so the enemies did have those capabilities. But to then expose yourself and and land your own plane that was fine and mm-hmm. then under fire rescue someone else that's incredibly impressive and i just thought of one other one that is another movie that i, I know a lot of people would know and that's black hawk down yeah, uh yeah, gordon yeah. and shugart sure. who sacrificed themselves and said hey we'll go protect that down pilot until the um um the other parts of um that element were able to reach and they were the both crash killed. and they were both killed and the pilot survived and the pilot yeah. survived because they went in uh to save him and we've actually uh, the the gentleman who Josh Hartnett plays, uh, Master Sergeant Eversman, in that movie, who was Sergeant Eversman at the time, uh, we've also had him on uh, Zero really? Blog Thirty. Uh, if you'd like to hear the the real story of Black Hawk Down, um, so we've just been so fortunate to 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 meet these people. I met Flo Groberg, uh, Dakota Meyer, uh, and these gentlemen are just everything that is right with our with our military. And each one of them has distinguished themselves, obviously. And, and carried themselves in such a way that to do honor to that award. Yeah, I think, it, and I remember seeing Black Hawk Down for the first time and knowing that it was based on a true story, and obviously they took some liberties with it. It was infuriating. Like, you know what I mean? Because you fall in love with these guys. Yeah. Like Gary Gordon and Stuttgart. Um, I'm going to I'm gonna end. I want to ask Go, you real quick. You're, you wear the bracelet. Yeah. Who do you wear it for? That uh, This is my buddy PK uh, from college, uh, um, Andrew Peterson Keel. Uh, he was a captain of Special Forces, Third Special Forces Group in Afghanistan, and he was training uh, an element, and uh, uh, Al-Qaeda, you know, put on a uniform and was admitted to the base and shot him. Wow. Um, so he, he was a great guy, and I'll tell you a really quick story because we went to college together, and he was uh, a smart dude, very charismatic. Everybody loved him, and we had a, a computer class my junior year, and I don't know shit from Shiloh when it comes from to computers and, like, coding and all that. So we get paired up and we're in a group together and I'm all worried about my grade. And he says to me, Connor, dude, stop complaining, dude. Stick with me. I will get you a B or a B plus. It's not a big deal. And then I'm like, all right, all right. And I go back to like working on whatever it is I'm working on. And I caught him under his breath. He goes, eh, probably more like a C, C minus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you're limited. Yeah, we actually, yeah. Um, it was um, March 11th. Oh, 2013. Wow. So okay. it was just 10 years. 10 year anniversary. Yeah, 10 year anniversary. Um, that we lost him. Uh, great guy. Oh, I'm sorry great to guy. hear that. Yeah. yeah Wasn't, didn't that make news? Wasn't that on like CNN? That story of someone showing up? I think up so. And, yeah. I, yeah. I, was, I kind of remember that. I think so. Wow. You should. Um, we're going to close with an old timer, Woody Williams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He just died also, last year. Sorry. <laughs> also a guest on Zero Blog 30. Yeah. So That's if you'd great. like to hear him, yeah. Chaps <laughs> speaks very highly of. He had an opportunity to go to the Woody Williams' house and, mm-hmm. and speak to him, and he said it was one of the few times he was nervous to have a conversation with someone when you consider what you're about to tell us. He's not, he was 98 uh, when he died last year. He was the last surviving Medal of Honor recipient from World War II. Wow. So when he died, his remains were laid out uh, in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like a, you know, like a head of state. He did not have an easy life. Uh, he was born the youngest of 11 children. At birth, he weighed only 3.5 pounds, wasn't expected to live. 
By the time he was 11, his father, Lloyd, had died of a heart attack, and several of his siblings had died uh, of the Spanish flu. Uh, after Pearl Harbor, again, he enlisted in the Marines solely because he liked their blue uniforms better than the Army's brown. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's why he chose the Marines. How often does that happen? Yeah. More than you'd think. Yeah. yeah. Swear to God. Yeah. It's like UNC over another school. Like, yeah. You want that yeah. Tar Heel blue. But yeah. the Marines, he was, he was just over 5'5". Five five. Marines were like, you were too short. But within a year, they uh, dropped those height restrictions because we were in war. Yeah. So originally, he was too, he was too small to fight. Short king. Uh, so 5'6". He was trained as a demolition man and in the use of flamethrowers. And that's what makes this interesting. Mm. He was sent to Iwo Jima to take out pillboxes. Pillboxes, we kind of know, right? Those Little cement bunkers. bunkers, bunkers yeah. They have only those slivers that you're able to fire out of. So he would kind of run up there, pop his flamethrower in, and blow. But we spoke about flamethrowers in Twisted Hip History of Weapons. They're, they're time bombs. You're bigger than everybody else. People see the flames and the black smoke. And they fire for you tanks on your back and essentially blow you up. Mm -hmm. So even when he was operating his flamethrower, he knew like if he was in a pillbox, he would start there and then constantly move because once the black smoke was, it was just people would pot shot. Uh, those uh, he those fuel tanks were four and a half gallons, and they were only good for seventy two seconds of sustained burn. So he refilled his tank uh, in Iwo Jima five times. So th this is it. Afterwards, he was quoted. We talked about the PTSD just a little bit, but he was quoted later on as saying, a person's life taken by flame is so, so horrible. There is an odor that emanates from that that's like no other odor on earth. And sometimes in the years after, there would be something, an odor from somewhere that would bring that back to me. Yeah. So he swallowed that down with a lot of booze. He a big-time booze bag for a long time. Mm -hmm. And then he found Jesus, and that's one of the mm -hmm. things that kind of got him through. So I, I, I can't go too much further into it, but just know Woody Williams, maybe 5'6", and barely 135 pounds, mm -hmm. right? 5'6", at the age of 21, Herschel Woody Williams single-handedly operated six flamethrowers. He had, you know, fresh tanks, six flamethrowers against Japanese forces for several hours and ultimately cleared a path for the American troops. Lived till uh, 98 and died last year. So we'll close it on Woody Williams.